Hello everyone, my name's Sherlyn and I'm a student nurse and paramedic based here in Melbourne, Australia. This is my video journal where I reflect on things I've learned in my degree and try to bridge any knowledge gaps. So this semester we're studying emergency childbirth and neonatal resuscitation. We were taught in one of our pracs about the importance of placing the pulse oximeter on baby's right hand during resuscitation and I wondered why is that? Well, I went away and did a bit of independent reading and I think I found a good answer. So today I'm going to go over the anatomy and physiology of this concept of preductal pulse oximetry. And that's going to make a lot more sense very soon. Quick disclaimer, I'm a student. I'm definitely not a paediatrician. My work hasn't been peer reviewed or endorsed by the uni or any other organisation, so please, if anything I say sounds not quite right, I definitely encourage you to seek a second opinion. Okay, so I'll just tell you the answer straight up. The reason why we place the pulse oximeter on baby's right hand is because it provides us with what we call the preductal oxygen saturation which is the measurement that's actually going to give us the highest uh, oxygen reading. So it's actually considered the best site to obtain a reading that we can then use to titrate our oxygen therapy. And that's basically it in a nutshell. If you're happy with that answer, there's no real reason to continue watching this video. However, if you would like to understand what that means in deeper terms, please do watch on because the nature of newborn circulation is actually super interesting and worth knowing about. Okay, so to understand this concept of preductal oxygen saturation, we need to understand the nature of fetal circulation, which is very different to adult circulation. And the reason it is so different is because, well, think about it, where's the source of oxygenated blood for the fetus? It's the placenta, right? So blood travels from the mum through the placenta, through the umbilical cord, and connects to the inferior vena cava of the baby via the ductus venosus. And when babies in utero, they're not using their lungs at all. I'm going to go ahead and draw a right-sided lung. They're not using their lungs, and in fact they can't because those lungs are actually full of amniotic fluid. So because there's no oxygen in the fetal alveoli, a funny thing happens called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So that's hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And some of you guys might remember this concept from when we did our essay for Para 201, but basically it's this idea that in the hypoxic lung, some vessels will constrict in order to try and shunt the flow of blood to other alveoli which might be more oxygenated. But unfortunately the problem here in the fetus is there's no oxygen to be found anywhere in the fetal lung. And because of that, you get widespread vasoconstriction. And this of course causes a huge amount of resistance in the pulmonary circuit, which of course creates resistance in the right side of the heart. <clears throat> so now we've got a bit of a problem. We need to get this supply of oxygenated blood from the right side of the heart into the left side without ever having to go through the lungs. So in order to overcome this, the fetal heart has two important adaptations. The first adaptation is the valve of the foramen ovale. The foramen ovale. Here's a little blown up version of it here. Uh, sometimes you hear the foramen ovale described as being a hole in the heart, but it's actually a valve. And the reason it's able to stay open in utero is because the pressure on the right side of the heart is so high, it's able to push blood through that one-way valve into the left side. The, uh, the other important adaptation is the ductus arteriosus, which is a little sneaky duct that connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta. And this uh, ductus arteriosus is really the key behind the concept of pre and post ductal oxygenation. So with this duct, you've essentially got 
blood coming, oxygenated blood coming out of the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery through the ductus arteriosus into the aorta, aorta and off to feed all of baby's other tissues without ever having to go through the lungs. Super interesting. Okay, so now let's bring it back into the clinical context. We've just delivered this baby uh, in the delivery room or maybe the back of the ambulance and they've started breathing spontaneously or maybe we're giving that baby positive pressure ventilations. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw this lung back in. Lungs are opened up now. So of course, the pulmonary vessels start to dilate and the pressure in the pulmonary circuit drops, which drops the pressure in the right side of the heart. So what comes out of that is you see this foramen ovale begin to close up pretty soon, usually within minutes of baby's first breath. And the lungs are now the source of oxygenated blood. So the flow of blood begins to look more like what you would see in an, in an adult, right? Desaturated on the right and oxygen rich on the left. I'm going to go ahead and color that in just so we can orient ourselves. So oxygen rich on the left side. And deoxygenated on the right side. Thing is, we still got this patent ductus arteriosus, and in fact, it can actually take one to two days for that ductus arteriosus to close in newborns. This means that potentially deoxygenated blood can leak in to the aorta through that ductus arteriosus and lower your oxyhemoglobin level. Now, here's the really important thing. This first branch off the aorta, which is called the brachiocephalic artery, supplies baby's head neck and right arm and importantly the brachiocephalic artery sits proximally to the ductus arteriosus so it's actually going to get less deoxygenated blood mixing in and that's really what we mean when we say that the right arm is preductile the other really important thing to note is that because the head and the right arm share a common parent artery, we can take the oxygen reading on baby's right hand to be a correlate for the oxygen reading in baby's brain, right? And that's really what we're measuring when we're measuring the preductal oxygen saturation. It's not so much that we care how much oxy oxyhemoglobin is going to baby's hand, we care about how much oxyhemoglobin is going to baby's brain. Okay, so what's the clinical significance of all that? Well, early studies have shown that the preductal oxygen saturation reading can be up to 5% higher than the postductal in the first 10 minutes of life. So if you're going to take a reading, say, off baby's left foot, you're going to get a falsely low reading. And 5% doesn't really sound like a big deal, but when you're talking about newborn resuscitation, it's really important to get a good proxy measure of that cerebral oxygenation so we don't accidentally overdo it and give this baby oxygen toxicity. And studies have actually shown that even brief exposures of hyperoxia are associated with pretty significant short and long-term morbidity for that baby. Remember, baby SATs when it's in utero is actually sitting usually only around uh, 70%. So it is gonna take a little bit of time to adjust to atmospheric air, which is why the Australia and New Zealand Council of Resuscitation provide us with this very specific oxygen guideline.
Okay, so there you go. One less mystery to worry about. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope this video was useful for some of you out there. Like I said before, I'm not an expert and I'm totally happy for any feedback. So my email is there. If you have any correspondence or questions, be happy to hear from you. Here are some references. <laughs>